Welcome everyone uh, and happy International uh, Women's Day. My uh, name is uh, Julie uh, Treop and I am part of the Unleash uh, Secretariat. So the International Women's Day is a global day uh, that celebrates the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women everywhere. Today is also uh, a day to uh, call to action for accelerating gender equality. Um, and because we at Unleash focus on the SDGs, uh, we also want to have a call to action to reach SDG 5. This year, uh, the International Women's Day focuses on choosing to challenge. Um, this means uh, calling out stereotypes, biases, and um, calling out um, gender discrimination. This past year has been a tumultuous one um, with COVID-19 and uh, political and social unrest in a, in a lot of parts of the, the world. Um, so on this panel, we'll also obviously address the effects of COVID-19 and other uh, societal events um, in the past year. So with me today, we have invited an incredible panel um, of people who are associated with uh, Unleash. We have former talents, um, Unleash Plus talents as well. Um, and we have a person from a lead scale a partner organization, Kimonix, with us as well. So please um, uh, support me in welcoming our panel, uh, which is Unita Sharma uh, from Nepal. She is the co-founder and CEO of Social Changemakers and Innovators, which is a youth-led nonprofit organization um, that works for improving health, hygiene, and nutrition um, of particularly women, children, and girls in Nepal through innovation, education, and entrepreneurship. Then we have uh, Diana Kendi, um, who is an award-winning uh, multimedia journalist and the communications and development manager at Kakenya Stream, which is an organization that invests in girls from rural communities through education, health, and leadership to create agents of change. Then we have Harshit um, Gupta, um, who runs a nonprofit called Womenite that conducts educational workshops and campaigns on issues like child sexual abuse, gender and menstrual hygiene in schools, colleges, and also works with uh, government uh, officials in India. Then we have Michelle Kwok, uh, who is from Canada, and she is um, an Unleash Plus a team member and the co-founder and CEO of Flick, uh, which is a platform that connects female uh, founders and leaders and students across uh, the world. Uh, and even though they um, launched last year, they're having um, a great impact uh, already. And then we have Sh uh, Shauna Keria um, from the US, uh, who is the global practice lead um, at uh, Chemonix's gender equality and social inclusion practice. So um, please welcome them and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. So now that we have sort of the, the titles and a little bit of knowledge about what it is uh, that you do, um, I um, wanted to kick us off by um, learning a bit more on what specifically within gender equality or the fight for equality that you focus on in your work and why that spe specific area uh, was of, um, of interest to, um, to you. So Diana, can you maybe talk a bit about what it is that really drives you um, in, in the fight for gender equality? Thank you so much, uh, Julie and the entire Unleashed team for inviting me to this wonderful discussion. Um, I'll just um, um, repeat or just say that <laughs> I work with Kakenya's Dream and our work is about women and girls. And my passion is about uh, girls from rural communities or women and girls from rural communities because of the harmful uh, traditional practices that those who are familiar with African communities, they can um, uh, agree with me that it's still, um, the practices are still rife in the African communities, most of them. And what I'm speaking about is the female genital mutilation. It is about arranged child marriages. And um, 
also teen pregnancy and other forms of gender-based violence. So my passion comes in because uh, when I was practicing as a journalist, I remember uh, doing stories about women and girls and I could just tell, you, I could meet girls who have undergone female genital mutilation and you're looking looking at girls of uh, the age of 11, 12, 13, and you're looking at if this girl has dropped out of school and she's been uh, subjected to female genital mutilation and thereafter an arranged child marriage. This is a cycle that will keep on in generations and generations. And what are, what are we going, what kind of generation are we going to have later as um, communities in Africa? And that's where my passion really grew up. And I realized all these things are happening especially to girls or women who've not had an education. And that's why I'm happy that I work with an organization where we invest in girls through education, because it's through education that they're able to um, uh, voice their challenges. They are able to speak up. They are able to uh, beat these kind of uh, forms of violence and speak up and also advocate for their rights as girls and as women in the future and also in their families. So thank you so much, Julie. Thank you so much, Diana. That's such important um, work. So there's a, a other of our panelists that are also using education as a as a tool. Um, Hashid, do you maybe want to uh, say why uh, this was of a particular interest to to you? So yeah. So uh, you know, I would like to start with a small incident. Uh, so during our first workshop uh, in a very good private school in Delhi, the capital of uh, India. We encountered a case where uh, the doctor who came for regular checkup, as is the routine in schools, he used to touch, uh, you know, uh, girls of the age group of around, I think, 12 to 14, inappropriately. And these girls basically couldn't report to anyone because uh, we, they are never actually taught about consent and everything. So during our workshop, it came out and then, you know, we took the legal actions and so so at that moment, we realized that we are actually trying to bridge the gap between these young voices and the stakeholders like the parents, the schools, authorities, et cetera, who are responsible for you know, ensuring the safety of these kids. Like one in three girls experience some kind of abuse before they turn 18 and the ratio is one is to five in case of boys. So we have been advocating and you know, raising awareness uh, uh, on child sexual abuse, gender and menstrual hygiene. So like uh, menstruation is still considered as a taboo in our society. If we talk particularly about the South Asian countries, and uh, we feel people fail to realize that this this is a beautiful biological process through which we all are born. So uh, we are uh, like actively working in schools, colleges, using education and awareness as a tool uh, to bring the change in the mindset of the society and uh, uh, to break the taboos that are uh, you know around this topic and the practices that is being prevailed, you know, unhygienic practices uh, still today in the country. So yeah, this is what uh, we are trying to do. Thank you, and, and Bunitza, that's also a subject that you're touching upon in, in your work. Can you um, tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, I have quite a similar story like Diana and Harshit. Um, so I particularly focus on the issue of women's health through my youth organization, Sochai. So while working in the community, I realized that people don't still see nutrition as a gendered issue. They still see it just as a health issue. But gender equality is a major reason that contributes to inadequate nutrition and food insecurity um, among women and children. Like even right now in the patriarchal system and structure, women are the ones who are the producer and provider in the households, but they do not have the control over resources. They are the one who cook the food, but they are the one who eat the least and the last in the family. And most of the times miss out on the important nutrients, especially when the girls are menstruating, they don't get adequate food. Uh, when they are pregnant and lactating, they don't get enough food uh, for themselves and their children. And um, this is the reason that we try to show the communities that it is actually a gendered issue. And then we work with uh, government uh, officials to bring um, gender on the mainstream while uh, planning and implementing uh, nutrition-based uh, solutions. Um, and our school programs, through the school's programs, we also focus on the importance of nutrition, especially uh, during menstruation period. Like Harshit said, it is still a taboo in our country. And one of the girls, she told me this, uh, that 
uh, you know, during menstruation, she's not allowed to drink milk because milk, uh, cows produce milk. And if the menstruating girls drink the milk, the cow will stop milking. <laughs> so that kind of misconceptions we still have in our community. And it's the reason we, I'm so passionate that, you know, we should focus the limelight on nutrition as a gendered issue and not just a health issue. Thank you. So another, um, you know, a very different topic uh, that we'll touch upon later, but something that you're working on, uh, Michelle, is also getting more uh, women to be leaders. Um, can you talk a bit about your work with with Flick and, and what inspired you to, to start that that work? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the the elevator pitch of it, I guess, is Flick is a platform and community hub that connects female founders and leaders with students from across the world through meaningful apprenticeship. So founders are able to get helping hands on their businesses and students are able to formulate their own projects to decide what they want to add, you know, to their portfolios. Um, they're able to get career relevant training. They get skills training with these leaders and also mentorship under establishing leaders, as well as kind of like an inner look into entrepreneurship from a young age. We actually recently released a report on the future of female founders and we um, surveyed founders from around the world and found that over 81% of women of color founders identified that they did not have a role model in the space that resonated with their identity when they were growing up. And I definitely resonate with that story because when I was growing up, um, the only careers that I really had accessibility to were medicine, law, accounting, and engineering. That was pretty much all my family told me I could be when I was growing up. Um, and entrepreneurship definitely wasn't one of them. And in fact, in my community, it, it was almost like a taboo subject. It was like, why would you want to be an entrepreneur? Or, oh, girls aren't meant to be entrepreneurs. That's a little bit too too much for you. And people would say that to me all the time. They'd be like, oh, you know, it's like a really tough world out there. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay, I guess I like won't do that. I, I remember thinking I, I'm probably not strong enough for this. So I just, why would I pursue it anyways? Uh, and I realized a lot of women around me also had the same thoughts and a lot of it was because we didn't have role models in the space and we didn't really have any uh, counterparts in the space that were saying, you know, you can do it too. Look at me, I've done it. Um, and so the idea behind it was, okay, the idea behind apprenticeship kind of came when I was in university, I was in medical science uh, in university and doing my degree in it, but it was the first time that I kind of was away from my family and I was thinking for myself. And I asked myself for the first time, like, do you really want to do this? And I was like, wow, have I even ever asked myself that before? And, um, and the answer was no. Like, I didn't think that I wanted to do this for sure for the rest of my life. And so I would reach out to startups all the time because I realized when I went to the career center, I'd be like, okay, I'm in a medical science degree. I want to get some business experience. I want to see if I can transition my career in some way or maybe work in health tech. And they were like, well, you have two options. You can either work in research or you can get your master's degree. And I was like, I don't want to do either of those things. <laughs> so um, I started reaching out to startups and particularly female founders because I found that I resonated with their stories the most. Uh, and I'd be like, hey, I'd love to start, you know, maybe I can just like work for free for you for social media. I'll do it for three months, like part time. And if that goes well, then hire me or if that goes well, then I'll do this, I'll do that. So from like social media management, I got to like marketing campaign management by third year of university. I was managing like tens of thousands of dollars in corporate sponsorship dollars from like Headspace, Nike, Disney. And I was in third year of university in my medical science degree. And I had more experience and more mentors in the business space than everybody who was at the business school at my university. Um, and I ended up being able to use this, this experience to graduate university early and start a company from an entrepreneurship program in Toronto. Um, and it, if I didn't have those mentors along the way, a lot of them being women saying, you know what, I wish that I could have told myself that I could have done this when I was younger, like 21, 22, 23. Um, if I didn't have those people along the way, I don't think I could have, you know, jumped off that cliff to be like, I can be a founder. I know people have told me my whole life that I can't be. Um, and even when I was trying to be one, like my family was like, why are you doing this? <laughs> uh, so I, I definitely see the power in community. I see the power in mentorship and I see the power in having even female founder community. So not only are we building a community for female founders and students to connect with one another, 
but it's also a resource hub for female founders. So female founders are able to get, you know, over $300,000 in startup perks and resources to reduce their burn rate, or we bring in mentors who are VCs and angel investors, or we have virtual cocktail parties for our founders so that they can find others who are at an early stage who are really going through the same barriers and challenges as them. And same thing with students, right? We're trying to build that meaningful community that can really accelerate entrepreneurial women through the female founder pipeline. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And, and Shauna, you're working uh, in a little bit of a different way, but also working, um, you know, on something that in the developing world um, has gotten more popular, so to say, which is also just applying a gender lens across projects. Can you talk a bit about the, the work that you do at, at Chemonics and, and why that was um, of interest to, to you? Sure. And it's, it's just so so wonderful to hear everyone's story about what drives them as like the starting point for a conversation because as I was listening I could hear things about it's not just about gender inequality and bias it's all it's about also other identities um, it could be whether you're a youth and what messages you're hearing as a young girl it could be if you're living in a rural community or you have less access to education or information about nutrition and and so that's why I'm I'm you know, really passionate about the work that I'm doing at Comonics because within this, this topic of gender equality, I think it's also important as, as we've been talking about to take that intersectional approach to understand how do multiple identities create overlapping systems of discrimination. Um, for me, for example, looking at the intersection of disability and gender equality. On a personal note, I'm a, a child of a deaf adult and my mom is deaf. So growing up, I saw how gender bias and others' perception about her ability or intelligence because she is deaf had an impact on her access and opportunity. For example, instead of directing questions to my mom when I was a child, they would direct questions to me to answer the question on behalf of her. And it really frames my understanding and my approach to intersectionality as I try to apply that lens in all that I do is and it's really why I'm so passionate about gender equality and social inclusion is, is how are these systems created to create access or opportunity? Um, if you look at, in my work now, looking at girls and women with disabilities, they're 10 times more likely to experience gender-based violence than those without disabilities. They're less likely to receive um, access to health, education, employment, be victims of bullying, GBV, sexual violence. And so I really think that as we take uh, an approach looking at all of our global programs and all the work that we do, um, we really have to be looking at that intersectional approach and that lens, because if we don't ask that question, we're not going to be reaching the people that we really intend to serve and work with in the communities to make sure that they have voice, they have agency, um, and they can make decisions over the future of their lives. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And then moving on to sort of our first topic of the day, which is related to, to COVID-19. Um, obviously, that has played a role in, in um, every person on, on Earth's life uh, this past um, year. Um, some research shows that, for, for instance, if you look at India as a, as a case example, that women do 10 times more uh, unpaid care work uh, than Indian men, uh, and that COVID-19 is even um, increase that burden of, of 30%. Um, that's probably true for, for a lot of other countries as well. Um, another uh, thing that um, has been heartbreaking is to, to read the statistics on uh, the increase in, in violence, uh, domestic abuse during the, the lockdown, um, that that is also increasing um, up to 30% in, in, a, in a lot of countries. And then there's just the, the, the pressure on women who make up most of frontline personnel, doctors and, and nurses um, as well. So I would be interested to hear, uh, Bonita, you work in nutrition and obviously there's a lot of uh, families now also struggling to even put food on the table. How has COVID-19 impacted the work that, that you do? Um, of course, if again, we are looking at it from the angle of um, gender and intersectionality, even before COVID, we were dealing with the kind of inequalities, but and with the pandemic, um, the gap has even widened, it has become even bigger. And while we were dealing with COVID when it started out, it was just a health issue for us. But then with time, it became like a socioeconomic issue. And it is putting an entire generation at risk from accessing the rights, opportunity, and dignity. And um, especially, it's very difficult for women who are engaged in, in informal sector because the economy came to standstill. 
um, uh, people started losing their jobs. And especially it was women who was bearing the brunt of the pandemic because they were the ones who were being laid off um, first. And um, from a health perspective, um, like you mentioned, uh, it has been especially difficult for mothers to get um, access to quality and nutritious diet. And this lack of nutrition is again, compromising their immunity and putting them at the risk of COVID infection, as well as other infectious diseases. Um, and most importantly, uh, because of the lockdown, uh, the mothers, they were not able to visit uh, to the local health center. And we being the young people, we also, we had the resources, but we couldn't go out because we had to stay shut at the home and we because like I come from a privileged position and while other women and other girls like me they were walking on the street in search of um, food and water and especially um, with the quarantine measures the workload has increased immensely for mothers uh, because they have to take care of their kids of, of elderly their husbands and they are already doing other jobs and there's this increased household burden, which is the unpaid care burden. And oftentimes um, it's the women from poor socioeconomic background who lack essential health service, have very little social protection and healthcare is also not affordable and accessible for them. And like, I feel that, you know, for me, uh, who is actually working in the front line, we had to shut our work for some time, but then we, it was very difficult for us to get the paperwork done and get ourselves mobilized in the front line. But then um, we uh, tried to uh, manage the resources, especially for the most marginalized and vulnerable by uh, creating uh, food and hygiene packages for mothers. And then we conducted community-based uh, nutrition assessment so that we could uh, find out uh, children with uh, cases of malnutrition then and there, and then refer to the nearby hospital. And um, especially, I've also realized that, you know, majority of um, uh, the investment or the resources, which was in issues such as safe abortion, HIV, or sexually transmitted diseases, it was focused on COVID entirely. And there was this chunk of women, girls, and people with other gender identities who were missing out on this basic essential health services, which are our human right. And um, I also realized that even my own friends who were working as nurses, um, they had a lot of challenges at home and their family were not taking it well because uh, you know, they, they were telling their uh, nurse's wife or nurse's daughter-in-laws that, you know, go back to your own hospital, don't come back home because you're ignoring us and you're putting our family at risk. So even this little, little uh, things that I see around me made me realize that there's still a long way to go to achieve gender equality. And I think the COVID crisis has made it even worse. And of course, there's still a huge responsibility that all of us have to carry to uh, make gender equality, um, we, to, we achieve it by 2030. Mm. And there are, as you say, there, there's a really long way to go and, and there's a bunch of different guesses as to how much COVID has set back um, different SDGs and, and SDG 5 included. Um, talking about one of the, the things that has obviously, um, that it's, it's becoming more evident that, that domestic violence is still um, a huge issue. Um, then I know that you have spent um, a big part of your career in, in journalism um, and also worked um, on stories on gender-based violence, uh, child marriage and female genital uh, mutilation. What are the stories that you're hearing in, in Kenya um, on how this is affecting um, women and, and girls? Um, thank you so much, Julie, for that question. I would say uh, for girls in uh, rural communities, one thing that we usually confident about is when they are in schools, at least we are, co we are confident or we are assured of their safety because um, these harmful traditional practices are being done with people maybe from their families, could be parents who are not so keen on girl child education and they, they are keen on uh, marrying their daughters at an early age and also looking at the uh, economic benefit that comes with it. So. Um, the, uh, in Kenya, we our schools closed in March when we had the first case around March 15, and then the government ordered for the schools to be closed, and this really exposed our girls to 
where we have been protecting them from being in terms of the community where it's still a slowly um, getting to learn more about the, the effects of the harmful uh, pr practices. And now we had to send them home. And uh, I know there's a time when the government even said that we, not did, we, we, we cannot have, the, um, we, we call uh, not safe spaces, but uh, like children homes or something. And for us, we have two boarding uh, schools for girls. So when we sent them home, then we put them, we exposed them to the, these harmful practices. And it really had an effect on us, especially when it comes to teenage pregnancy, because once a girl has become pregnant, what the parent thinks of first, especially in the community that you're working in, is marrying them off because of the shame that comes along with it. And also remember that this girl's education thing has not been there it's not that something that they've been championing ever since. So it's something that we are trying to teach them slowly by slowly. So most of the girls were affected by teenage pregnancy and then it, 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 it worsened the situation about child marriage. And then now getting these girls back from, getting them from their husbands or where they've been married to was quite challenging. And I would say um, if, if, if there's anything to say is that COVID, it's like took us back a little bit because now the efforts that we have been putting in terms of um, mm. enlightening girls and the, and, and, the, and the community about the importance of girls education was kind of, has gone back to not zero, but at least it has taken mm. us back some few steps uh, 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 backward. But I know that achieving gender equality still, it's all, it has to start with us educating the, the communities that you're working with in terms of uh, the importance of educating a girl. And I want to comment on something that Michelle said, which I found it resonated well with what you're doing at some point, though I would say, uh, we, we, we are not struggling in the entrepreneurship world where they are in getting women into entrepreneurship, but now getting women into careers that are meant or they have been, uh, when I grew up, I knew there are some careers for men, especially when it comes to sciences, tech, uh, technology, mathematics, engineering, architectural, and all those kinds of careers. So even lack of the role model among us um, communities where we work in is, is something that affects or hindering the progress when it comes to gender, achieving gender equality. And I would say maybe um, we did some intervention, like we had to provide uh, care packages for our girls, that is from food, from um, the, the girls' uh, staff, uh, soap, the simple things that one may think, oh, do they really need this? Yes, they really do. And in, in that intervention, we are able to cater for the whole family. Because another thing that also uh, makes the situation worse is poverty. And you're looking at when they're in school, at least they, are, uh, they, are, they, are, they are have access to even healthy meals and all that. But when they go back to maybe families that are polygamous, they have 20, 30 kids, it's not easy. So you can imagine where uh, the parent is just a smallholder farmer. It's, it's, it's a bit difficult for them. So we did some intervention like that one. And also the, uh, uh, the teenage pregnancy uh, campaign or awareness. And we are still slowly coming back to at least to reach to where we were because even getting some girls back to school was not an easy thing. Once they, their minds are already corrupted and then they are coming from the same families that advocate for their uh, child marriage. So even trying to bring them back to education is important. I'll tell you it was not an easy thing, but we are working slowly towards achieving that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I saw Shona that you were nodding a lot while uh, Diana was uh, was speaking. Um, are, are those the same trends that you are seeing in the work? I know that Kimonics works in so many different countries, but some of what are some of the the trends that you are seeing coming out and how that's affecting gender equality across uh, the world? Thank you. Yeah, and Diana mentioned something that I was I was nodding a lot because I've been thinking about this a lot. Just what has the impact of COVID done? for the progress on, on gender equality that we've made to date. Um, I was reading some reports recently from UN Women that they did this survey of 38 countries and they wanted to kind of assess what are the economic consequences of loss of jobs, of loss of livelihoods. And it's expected to push 469 million women and girls uh, living in extreme poverty. So it's just, you know, it's, it's, I think about things like, you know, 
childcare and other burdens that you have, the double burden and, and how that is gonna be impacting us beyond when the pandemic subsides, like what is going to be the impact economically, socially uh, for the role uh, of women and girls in, in furthering equality. Um, and, and another topic that we've been really focused on, which is devastating, is the shadow pandemic, is looking at the impact of gender-based violence and domestic violence in the home. Um, one thing that we've grappled with a lot at Kalonix, and we've tried to find new ways of, of reaching uh, the, the communities we work with is, you know, when women are staying at home or, you know, when children are at home in situations that are unsafe with violent partners, separating them from people and resources that can really help them. Um, and at the same time, knowing that health systems are stretched to the breaking point, domestic violence uh, centers are, are reach capacity, then how do they get help? How do they get support? How do they get information around resources? So we've been trying to pivot and, and find ways that we can reach them virtually, which I know they have limitations and there's less access, but um, you know there are a few examples of how we've been able to do this successfully in the Dominican Republic, for example, we partner with community justice houses and NGOs to provide online psychological support to GBV uh, survivors and victims um, through mediation, mental health counseling. Um, in Myanmar, which is our Promoting Rule of Law project, we've um, found a way to partner with a local organization to provide sign language interpretation uh, for legal advice services through like virtual connections, which has been one um, great way to kind of at least inform or educate around what are your rights? Where are some appropriate services that you can go to for help? Um, and in Rwanda, we uh, opened a toll-free line for services for GBV victims um, and advertise this via the radio uh, public service announcement. So there are ways that we're saying, okay, here's how our programs normally would have, have functioned. But in this time in the pandemic, there is an emerging need and we have to respond to that. And we have to give uh, access for new resources and you know, there are limitations to, to connecting virtually, internet access, safety, confidentiality, um, but we have to try um, to provide those services. And it's devastating that we're seeing these staggering numbers. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that, that with through some of these new support systems that, that they will get the services and access that they need. Um, but I'm, but it's, it is devastating to see see these numbers and to see the impact that that will have for years to come. Mm -hmm. Hashid, um, as, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot of overlap in the work that, that you and, and Bunisa Shaman does um, or do. Um, how, has, how has COVID affected your ability to, to do your job, so to speak? Um, and which ways have you tried to, um, to change your organization to make it um, fit for the current um, pandemic? So uh, uh, definitely, you know, like COVID was a kind of uh, big blow to the organization's work because, you know, most of our work has been in terms of uh, uh, like conducting these offline workshops in schools and colleges. And as Diana mentioned, you know, similar thing happened in India also, like the schools were shut uh, around 15th and 20th of March. So we couldn't work uh, much on ground. But like we were on field, you know, starting with our relief work in terms of uh, cook food and dry ration kits for the families because everyone was trying to help the people because migrants, you know, like people were out of the jobs, uh, especially the female sector because they were into the informal sector. So that's why. But then, you know, soon we realized that uh, girls were facing a major problem in the sense that they used to get free pads from the uh, schools and like, you know, the schools were shut. So, you know, uh, they didn't have access to the sanitation. And uh, since, uh, you know, like women, women were also out of jobs, like, you know, their economic resources uh, decreased. And uh, as you know, everyone shared that, you know, women don't basically give priority to themselves, you know, first when it comes to families and everything. So that's why, like, you know, we started this campaign called hashtag end period poverty to raise awareness on menstrual hygiene management and also to motivate these women, like, you know, to avail the government services of subsidized paths. And that like, you know, throughout uh, since uh, April 2020, we have been working for this campaign. And so far we have distributed more than 500,000 pads uh, impacting over 50,000 girls and women. So like that. And other than that, like uh, since, you know, offline things were like, were not in our control, like because of the lockdown restrictions by the government in terms of the gatherings and everything. 
we resorted to the online mediums like you know the webinars the instagram and all today's awareness and motivate the youth so that they can you know in their community they can spread a word and ensure that you know uh, people are at peace so other than that like we kept on doing offline surveys and definitely you know like as the statistics also mention that there has been an increase in the domestic violence and women couldn't like because of the restrictions they couldn't go uh, go out and you know like report to the police stations or you know like earlier they could have discussed uh, with their uh, peer group or with other members but since like everything they, like they all were confined in a single place so naturally you know the cases increased and there was no one to report to so uh, like yeah i mean like covid has did definitely impacted and uh, uh, but a lot of organizations they came in together you know to uh, work on different agendas and i think that only helped the society you know like survive otherwise like uh, it would have been a kind of very difficult situation so yeah i want to move on um from from talking about um about COVID and, and some of the other movements that we've seen in the past couple of years. So obviously um, last year, uh, Black Lives Matter um, shaped a lot of, of the conversations and continues to, uh, to do so. Um, also sparking conversations on intersectionality, um, showing that women of color uh, earn more or earn less than their uh, male counterparts. Um, and that in general, they're also suffering more from you know, the pandemic and the work that they um, um, get to do, uh, forced to do. Um, so I just wanted to touch upon something or return back to something you said, Michelle, earlier on um, role models um, and how intersectionality and, and race also plays a role in the work that you do, um, knowing that um, people of color um, might be even less declined than um, white women to, to start their own businesses. How have you worked with this in your organization? Yeah, that's interesting that you bring that up because that was also a part of our future female founders report that we put out um, in Q4 of 2020. We, we asked our founders, how do you think the BLM movement is going to affect black female founders going forward? Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be neutral? Um, and it was interesting because 51% of the women of color who answered that question said that they did not think the BLM movement was still going to make a significant difference in BC. And so we started asking our black female founders for their own stories about what was happening. And it was so interesting because so many of their stories were the same. It was that, yes, VCs were way more willing to take meetings with them. They were, they were interested in taking meetings with them, but they were never going to sign the check. So what they felt like was that they were just tokens in in this grander um, this this grander scheme of these VCs saying, "Wow, I, I've taken X amount more meetings with women of color," but at the same time, their portfolios aren't changing at all. And so what all of these you know founders are saying are, you know what, you should be. There's a lot of talk that's going on. I think BLM has definitely increased the talk that's going on, but not significant action that is saying, I'm actually gonna put X amount of money into black female founders this year. Um, there's just saying in general, we're willing to support more female founders and what, and, and because they haven't been able to speak to a lot of these black female founders for a while, a lot of them found that they were building companies that were for black women to support black women. So for example, one of them, her name is Nena Umello, and um, she, she started a company called Black Hair Management. And she says that for at least 30 to 40 minutes of every VC meeting, which is pretty much most of it, they're questioning her why she's starting this company in the first place and why black women would even pay for, um, for hair management, uh, for hair management products. And so she, she was saying, they're way more willing to take the meeting with me because they wanna say that they took the meeting with me, but they don't even take the time to research what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and how that affects Black women. And she's like, it should be self-explanatory that we have different hair and that we need to have different hair management and people pay for these products. And I already have traction, so I don't understand why 30 to 40 minutes of this meeting is me explaining to all of these classically, you know, white men VC, uh, VCs, why Black women need my products when uh, they're not even taking the time to understand why. Um, so I find it, I found that really, really interesting that uh, a lot of these female founders 
noticed that there's a lot more talk around how to support um, BIPOC women in, in business and in entrepreneurship, but there isn't like dedicated action towards it. There, it, there aren't absolute statements saying, we're definitely going to be doing this. This is our goal as to how many female founders we wanna be in our portfolio. This is our goal as to how much we wanna to put towards uh, black women this, this year. And I think that needs to change um, in terms of the students. I think a lot of them have felt the same way that there's just a lot of talk, but at the end of the day, they're not getting the job. Um, there's a lot of them, you know, interviewing and all these, all these companies at the, in, at the, at the interviews are taking photos of uh, the interviews being like, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're hiring for diversity and look, this is like all of our pool of diverse candidates, but at the end of the day, they're not getting the job. Like I've, I've heard, I've literally heard um, some people that I know who are white men say, oh, this job was actually supposed to go to a diversity hire. But since I know the boss, I ended up getting the job instead. And so it's all of these, you know, there's old, I think there's a lot of old fashioned pattern matching that's going on in all of these areas and, you know, hiring and entrepreneurship and VC and of course, so many other aspects of business and just in life. Uh, and there's a lot of talk around it, but there's not a lot of significant action. I think that that's very interesting and, you know, in actually maybe having a, uh, an easier time getting the, the meeting now that we have several of, of you on the um, on the panel that are female founders, are you also finding yourself in this token position of being invited in because of the sort of the, um, the attention to having, you know, investing more in, in females, but then not really seeing people follow through? I mean, I've personally yeah, encountered it, are. I think. <laughs> I think I've personally encountered it where, the, where people will reach out to me and they'll say, in a general terms, they'll be like, oh, wow, I love the work that you do uh, to help women. Like that, that's pretty much the same thing that everybody says to me when they're reaching out to me. And then we get into the meeting and they're like, this is, a, this is something that I've heard multiple times. Like it almost doesn't phase me anymore, but they, they get into the meeting and they're kind of like, okay, so tell me about what you do. And I'm like, so what do you know about what I do? And they're like, oh, something about like helping women. And I'm like, so you literally didn't even look at what I do, first of all. And then the second thing is after I explain what I do, they are usually like, oh, you know, my only, our only concern is that the market size is too small um, because you're only servicing women. And that's almost every single meeting. That's almost every, how every single meeting has gone is they want to connect because we support female founders and we help women, like just literally generally, they just say that. And then, um, and then they don't really know what we've done. They're like, oh, I kind of looked at your website. And I'm like, well, I mean, you could have just like take, taken the 45 seconds to look at the website and you probably would have understood. Um, and then, and then afterwards, it's the, the oh, great, L love what you're doing. I think it creates really positive impact. The market size is just too small for us. And that's almost every meeting. At Chemonix as well, it's also, you know, equality versus equity. Um, so I would love to hear more on like how you work with that. Um, we did a, an Instagram poll um, today um, on Anisha's channels and asked if people actually knew what the what the difference was and, and I was surprised of how many I think it was around 75% that said that they knew uh, what it was but it is terms that are used interchangeably sometimes at least um, can you maybe kick us off with like a brief explanation of the difference and then um, talk um, a bit on how Kimonix works with the, with the two sort of um, uh, concepts Sure, I'd be happy to and also um, happy to talk a little bit about racial equity as well as, as gender equity, but a quote that really helps me kind of frame our approach to achieving gender equality is, if gender equality is the goal, then gender equity is the means of getting there. So to ensure, you know, fairness, we need to look at historical trends um, and systemic bias and discrimination and, and really take those measures to ensure that there's fairness. Um, so for example, if we're looking at racial equity or, or racial uh, equity as well, then we need to hold companies and leaders accountable. Um, so for example, when it comes to recruitment, equal pay, promotion opportunities, 
it's important to look at those historical trends and identify where there is a systemic bias and take measures to correct them. In some cases, when it comes to representation at the leadership level and those in the decision-making power, like Michelle said, okay, well, we're invited, but we don't really have a voice because there's not an intention to really commit to us, to invest in us. Um, so it's important to set goals. It's important to set targets to ensure that there's gender balance and representation at the top. Um, often gender uh, or racial discrimination is so ingrained in the way we behave and think that it's unconscious. It's an unconscious bias. Um, I know that we've all like thought about that and reflected on that a lot, but then practically, what does that mean? How do you, how do you get people, especially leaders, to reflect on that, to change behavior, um, and I think, or change work culture? And I think it's important that all staff, especially those in the leadership and management positions, to take that unconscious bias training to reflect on their own behavior and they're held accountable to advancing gender and racial equality through um, equity measures. So at Comonix, I think, you know, we're trying to push for that. I think we've made a lot of progress on that front um, and there's still a long ways to go. And the fact that we can reflect on that and acknowledge that I think is important because if you don't even understand that there's, you know, we can change our behavior, we should be changing our behavior, then you really have a long way to go. So I think that we're, we're making a lot of progress to get there um, to hopefully have you know, equality for all genders um, in, in aspects of our life. Um, and I think that equity measures will really help us get to those outcomes that are really fair and just. Mm -hmm. Now I'm, I'm looking at uh, the, the one man that we have on the, the panel today, because obviously there's a, a lot of great things happening. And as you're saying, Michelle, it's like women creating businesses that support other uh, women. But I see you're also um, here because you've created an organization to, to help women and, and girls. Um, can you talk a bit about what allyship means to, to you and, and maybe some, some words of encouragement to um, men that want to be better allies um, to colleagues or, or simply to friends or, or family members? Yeah, I think uh, the first part, like, you know, I was having a discussion with my friend, you know, she, when I shared the poster of this uh, panel discussion. So, you know, we had a, uh, a similar thought that uh, I think men should uh, join more women panel. I mean, like, usually it is seen when it comes to even, uh, you know, women agendas, like, you know, we say menstrual hygiene is a uh, women agenda, uh, crime against women is a women agenda. In all these panels, like usually it is seen that, you know, men dominating all the things only, uh, you know, will find uh, one woman out of like maybe four or five panelists. It's so, like we men, you know, can't understand the pain of a woman. Like when it comes to menstruation, like we can't understand the kind of pain, uh, you know, the women go through. And there is so much like, you know, I was in Sweden, uh, you know, uh, for a program and uh, during a conversation with a Swedish parent, like. Uh, I asked why Scandinavian countries, they play an important role when it comes to gender equality. So he said that, you know, at kindergarten age, uh, you know, the kid is being taught about consent, about touch, which we people, you know, especially in South Asian countries fail to, you know, talk about. And I think maybe, you know, in whatever capacities and roles, especially as a male parent, you know, uh, the father should talk uh, to the child, you know, about these things. Uh, make them feel comfortable. In fact, about periods, like a lot of trend has been, you know, like uh, the trend has been changing, but still a long way to go. Like uh, we should basically, you know, crime against women is a kind of civil war. Like we men need to change our perspective the way we see women. Like, you know, we uh, see our maybe, you know, mothers and sisters through a different angle and the rest of the women in the world, you know, through a different angle. I think that difference uh, has to be, you know, like uh, removed and, you know, we need to respect that they also have boundaries. So, uh, and I think uh, uh, I would say that the whole society has to play a part uh, in this thing where the sensitization is important at a very basic level and not when, you know, like when uh, men are, uh, you know, grown up and then we say, you know, like we need to change them. So things can't change because everything becomes so rigid that their mentality can't change towards the society, especially women. So we need to start at a very basic level. And I think uh, this is where, you know, the whole society has to play the part, all the stakeholders. So it's not just that, uh, you know, for example, if you talk about child sexual abuse, it's not just, you know, the girl's face, even boy's face, but we may not talk, you know, like, you know, everything, the basic things like we, we are not supposed to cry or, you know, share our feelings. And that's why it becomes so hard and, you know, the whole perspective keeps on changing. 
so this is what i think uh, you know we can do and especially you know the first point of you know joining more women panel so yeah kudos to everyone that you know the, the kind of work you guys are doing so yeah Thank you, Ashit. Um, just a follow-up question on that. So, um, what would be your like small piece of advice if a man was to to start uh, tomorrow or even better today on being a better ally? What would be a, a thing that they could um, start out with? I think uh, changing the perspective of seeing a kind of woman and uh, uh, being sensitized about different issues. For example, periods about consent about touch. You know, like uh, unconsciously, you know, we speak such words which harm the women. And especially, you know, for example, another thing could be in terms of dividing the domestic workload. I mean, like it's not their duty to, you know, manage the whole household. Uh, especially in COVID-19, we have seen uh, women face the double burden thing. Like, you know, they have to work and earn outside. And at the same time, you know, they are expected to work at home equally, you know. So I think this is what uh, the males have to play the part. Like if a woman is working, the men should also equally take part in the household activities, maybe in terms of, you know, uh, taking care of the child. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, the final subject that I want to touch upon is entrepreneurship. Um, and I know that we don't have that much uh, time left, um, but I wanted to hear from, from you, Bonita. Obviously, one of the, the big things of Unleash is um, innovation and, you know, fostering um, entrepreneurship. Um, to women who are, you know, maybe listening in or will watch this, um, what would be your piece of it, advice um, on uh, sort of um, getting them to, to maybe start their own uh, organization, uh, whether it's related to gender equality or not? Um, uh, of course, we as women have like multiple barriers uh, whenever we are, <laughs> we set out to do something on our own. Um, especially I tell this from my own experience because uh, while running my own company, Asochai, um, I have felt unwelcome and disrespected uh, when I was entering spe spaces that are occupied by men, especially in the government offices, uh, where there we have to go for financial and administrative proceedings and meeting. And um, what, how we get treated on those kind of spaces is based on our age and our gender. And it was really challenging for me to navigate all through that because we were never taught to you know, tackle or cope with that kind of challenges. Um, if if I um, think of about my childhood or teenage years, I remember that in our patriarchal structure, women are told to not go outside, not, not mingle, but men are encouraged to be risk taker, be confident, be bossy. Um, but women, like there is this saying that, you know, you need to have three M's for a woman to be complete, uh, man, marriage, and motherhood. And no matter how much a woman achieves, <laughs> if she doesn't have all three of those, she is not a complete woman. Um, and still we have to face all, the, all those challenges and it kind of like makes us get scared like to go out there and do something on our own. But I think um, one advice and my suggestion is it's, it's, um, we, go, we do that by step by step. And I think everybody has a role to play. Um, especially I think it should start from on our home and how we uh, teach our kids about um, uh, gender stereotypes and uh, how we neutralize those kind of things and um, how we encourage our girls to go out there and um, give them this hope and dream that they can do anything they want. And the next step is we go through schools where we teach about comprehensive sexuality education where girls learn about gender intersectionality they uh, learn about the differences um, and the norms and the stereotypes that the society puts for us and how we can tackle those things. And I think it's also very crucial um, for us to um, build our own skills because uh, one of the things that I missed out was the skill to you know, build our communication negotiation skills um, and how we sort of grab those resources and opportunities that are out there, but we are not able to access them. And the next round is the stakeholders, the government organizations, institutions. I think they sort of play a huge role in um, designing that kind of policies, which enable women to get out on those spaces. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a systematic process. And I think it should start from uh, the ground up. 
And I think uh, it is uh, possible because even in this uh, platform, I think there are a lot of inspirational women and men who have set an example that if you set your heart and mind to something, you can achieve anything you want. We just need an enabling environment for us to grow and thrive. Thank you so much, uh, Bunita. I think that that is a perfect segue into uh, sort of the, the closing of this conversation. I just wanna have a quick round where everybody says something that has made them hopeful or is making them hopeful for the future. Now we've touched upon um, a lot of um, the negative effects of, of COVID um, and other subjects, but um, we're also always looking at ahead and, and um, towards uh, 2030 uh, specifically. Um, so Diana, um, will you start or kick us off with what is making you hopeful for the future? So uh, what gives me hopeful for the future is that even amidst all these challenges, the pandemic and all that, I still meet women who have um, made up their mind to go for what they want in terms of achieving their dreams and beat all those odds and saying that my daughter won't be uh, married off at an early age. I didn't get an education. I want to see my daughter with uh, getting an education, becoming who they want to be and just seeing them taking the fro forefront, uh, um, the front line in terms of just fighting for their own rights and ensure, uh, ensuring that it doesn't repeat itself. What happened in their life is not repeating into their daughter's lives and all that. So that's what keeps me hope that one day we shall achieve this gender equality, even if it's 2030 or beyond, but at least one day we shall achieve it. Thank you so much. Shona. Um, a conversations like this make me hopeful. Um, but I also think that at Comonix, um, I see a real commitment more than I've ever seen to diversity and inclusion from the top. And I think there's a depth of technical knowledge and ded dedication across all of the projects globally. Um, and what that indicates to me is that there's not just an awareness that gender equality and social inclusion is the right thing to do, but that it's the fundamental thing to do if we want sustainable development, if we want communities to be thriving. Um, I also work with brilliant gender and social inclusion experts every day globally. And I think that's inspiring. I think for International Women's Day, we received so many stories of the amazing work they're doing. For example, in Pakistan, they recently trained, one of that, the programs recently trained 150 women-led businesses through with uh, a partnership with Facebook with uh, the She Means Business Initiative. Um, and they you know, expanded opportunities for Pakistani women to engage in the digital marketplace, which is super cool. And there's just many more stories like that. So I am really driven um, and inspired by that. And I think personally, I'm hopeful that I have two little girls and that they can be inspired by the work that I'm doing and see a bright future for themselves where they can achieve anything that they hope to. And they have the power to make the world more inclusive, uh, particularly for those don't, who don't have the same opportunity that they do. So those are some things that make me hopeful too. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah, I think um, uh, definitely what everyone else said so far, but have had, I've been in way more conversations like this and panels like this that are focused on gender equality and um, what we need to be doing to strive for equity moving forward in the future. So I think definitely all of these types of conversations make me very hopeful, but also within our community, we've we've had so many other young women who have come up to us and said, I didn't even know that becoming a female founder, you know, I didn't know that becoming a founder was even possible for women. And I think I want to be a founder too. And so having those conversations with people in our community definitely makes me super hopeful and makes me understand the importance of the work that we're doing. Cause I'm like, it's not just me that felt that pain point. And it's not just me that wished that I had had mentors along the way that resonated with my identity when I was younger. Um, so I think just creating more communities for women that are really meaningful for them and having them engage in them like in depth, I think has, has made me very hopeful for the future. And Rashid? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I feel that uh, like whatever the obstacle can be, you know, in terms of the problem and everything, when people come together, they can solve like anything. So in fact, when we, like in India, you know, the situations are so uh, like, you know, pathetic when the lockdown happened, you know, people were like out on the streets and everything. 
that different stakeholders they came together so i think the partnership is a kind of very positive sign towards solving any issue and then second i feel that there are people out in the world who are there to appreciate the kind of work you know uh, everyone is trying to do to uh, to basically you know to create a positive impact i think uh, that motivates uh, you know people to do more so yeah and when you say you made um, made your point so uh, eloquently but i also wanted to give you um, an opportunity to to share um yeah so we've heard that you know whenever life gives you lemon you make a lemonade out of it but uh, during the pandemic i saw that young people were making a juice jam pickle and whatever it was possible out of that lemon so it made me really hopeful and happy to see young people engaged in bringing out new innovation technology to tackle um, existing and new challenges so that has made me really hopeful and I think every person on the planet has shared the crisis. It's time to share the solutions too. And of course, um, unleash the potential of young people. Thank you so much, uh, Punisa. And I will say that what is making me hopeful is knowing that there are people like you out there doing such incredible um, work. It's really been a pleasure hosting you um, and having you here for International Women's Day. Um, so thank you again for, for being here, but especially thank you for all of the impact that you're having on uh, women and, and girls everywhere. Um, at Unleash, uh, we're obviously committed to all of the SDGs, um, but we are also looking at how we can better commit to uh, SDG 5. Um, so in the coming week, we're putting more focus on uh, gender equality and also how we as an organization can be more inclusive um, to non-binary people um, and have more people uh, participate in, in our programs um, that don't identify as, a, as a male or, or a female. So um, look out for our social media um, coming out and we're always open for suggestions as to how we as an organization can do better and support um, female yeah, founders yeah. and entrepreneurs. Thank you so much and happy International Women's Day again. Thank you to Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Happy Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Women's Day. Thank you.